If you take this practice on, just like I was in that first yoga class and I spent almost the whole class in child's pose. See, it's not just the thing, it's the meaning of the thing. And, and that yoga class, it wasn't just the actual physical practice, it was that I was there taking care of Kelly. You know, and when I take myself out to run uh, these days, it's the meaning of that act as much as it is the act itself. You're listening to the Wisdom for Wellbeing podcast, the show that blends science and heart to bring you evidence-based tips and tricks for cultivating a healthy, wealthy, and meaningful life. Now, here's your host, therapist, yogi, and fellow Full Life Balancer, Dr. Caitlin Harkis. Hi there. Welcome back to Wisdom for Wellbeing and part two of our interview with Dr. Kelly Wilson. If you're just jumping in here, by all means, come have a listen now. But if you have the space, I would definitely recommend that you head to last week's interview so that you can start fresh in this wonderful conversation where Dr. Wilson shares with all of us first medicine. So Dr. Kelly Wilson is a professor emeritus of psychology at the University of Mississippi. He was founding president of the Association for Contextual Behavioral Science and is one of the co-founders of Acceptance and Commitment Therapy. Dr. Wilson has devoted himself to the development and dissemination of acceptance and commitment therapy, relational frame therapy, and their underlying theory and philosophy, publishing 11 books, including Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, The Process and Practice of Mindful Change, and The Wisdom to Know the Difference, an Acceptance and Commitment Therapy workbook for overcoming substance abuse, as well as over 100 articles and chapters on related basic and applied topics. In this part of Dr. Wilson's interview, you're going to hear about how you can actually think of yourself as someone you truly love to really foster your movement towards habits that are healthy and sustaining in cultivating your well-being. He'll talk you through the definition of, and I say in air quotes, discipline and how small steps matter. You know, a five second run is really a fantastic achievement. It does not have to be, you know, a 10 kilometer run. You can do what is right for you and slowly, slowly do these small bits to create a fantastic habit for your life. He'll also talk you through monitoring social toxins and the concept of sensitivity and how that affects us. Also, he throws in such a beautiful mindfulness exercise that he learned from one of his grad students, so I highly recommend sticking around to the end. But without further ado, I have to hand it over to the amazing Kelly Wilson. You know, individual exposures to toxins, including social toxins, we're pretty able to come back off of those. Chronic exposure, uh, uh, to toxins um, uh, produce um, a chronic illness. That's a good way of remembering it. Chronic illness from chronic exposure to toxins, both physical and social. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, or environmental. So Kelly, with that, what could we be doing to sort of buffer, buffer everything that's going on here? Well, so here's a, I, I think, uh, 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 um, let, me, let me provide a, a little bit of a, a kind of a framework for action because particularly like right now we're in the middle of this freaking pandemic and people are in all manner of, you know, different kinds of levels of uh, lockdown and their travel has been restricted and they're having to cope in ways that their lives are not set up to cope. Mm -hmm. um, and the last thing I would want to do uh, to your listeners is to give them another thing or 10 things to put on their to-do list. You know, I mean, they're, they're in tears. You know, there are people listening to this right at this moment, you know, who are like in tears right now because they, they cannot do half of the things that are on their list already. Yeah. So let me 
provide this um, a, a little bit of a framework uh, before I say um, anything about what it is that we can do. That would be um, fantastic. So I, a couple of things. Um, when I started taking care of myself, it was not because I should take care of myself. Many, many people have told me I should take better care of myself. I, um, just for listeners who can't see it, you're wagging your finger right now, which is the perfect <laughs> physical description yeah, I mean, of what was going care. on. You should take better care of yourself. You <laughs> should eat better. Blah, 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 blah. You know, I mean, I don't like being told what to do. Most people don't like being told what to do. And I'm not here to tell anybody what to do. You know, what I am, you know, if I could recall back to the beginning of this um, conversation, when I uh, asked people to like, um, uh, you know, I asked you and I asked people in that workshop to think of somebody who you love like uh, crazy and, and to really spend a moment thinking about somebody who you love like crazy. Like think of their, the face, their, the way they smile, you know, every person has their own particular, uh, you know, way that uh, that smile gets expressed and maybe there's a particular look in their eyes or maybe it's somebody you've been close enough to that you could bury your nose in their hair and, and, and you know that each person has their own individual smell that you can't quite describe, but you'd know it, right? So like to get near that experience of uh, being with someone that you love. And I know that as I say this, that some people are, maybe can't see the people who, that they love right now. They don't have ready access to them. Um, but if you could reach out to them, um, let me give you a, 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 something that you might do. So maybe you, if, if that uh, person who you were thinking about who you love like crazy is somebody who you could send them a text message or something like that, like maybe it's a friend uh, or a parent um, or a niece or a nephew or somebody like that. And I said, think of somebody who you love like crazy. Maybe after you listen to this podcast, you could like get off the podcast and think about them for a minute and then maybe send them a message and say, you know, this crazy college professor from the U S <laughs> asked us to think of somebody who we love like crazy. And, uh, and I thought of you today and I remembered how, how we used to read together or I remember how we used to walk together or I remember how you used to put me to bed at night and uh, you'd kiss me on the head before I'd go to sleep. Now you see, mm -hmm. like, what would it mean to you if someone reached out to you in that way? So when I asked you, think of somebody who you love uh, like crazy. Mm -hmm. So, so I I'm thinking of my daughter right now. Thinking of your daughter. I mean, like, I guess um, if I think outside of my scope my dad is in canada i'm in australia right now so i'm going to use him right. as my example because i also love him dearly and he's not someone that i'm in physical proximity with all right so let me let me just ask you to pause for just a moment mm. um, and maybe i can ask everybody you know who listens to this to pause for just a moment and think of somebody in your life who maybe you're not near to right now but that that you could reach out to them um, somebody who you love like crazy. And, and so if you're thinking of your dad or a friend, and just take a moment and see if you can picture their face. And maybe you can remember the times you have spent together. And maybe for some people, it stretches back across time. Maybe you can remember really early things that you did together and see if you can think of moments when you really had a sense of that love. You know, of, of loving that person. And maybe they even caught a little glimpse of it in your eyes. And so then let me just kind of bring you back to the conversation. And let me ask you, 
could you think of uh, something you used to do together with your dad? Yeah, he used to read me Rupert the Bear before I go to bed every night. And that was oh. always, always a favorite. <laughs> All right. So imagine that after this, you sent your dad a message and say, this crazy guy said, think of somebody who you love like crazy and think of a moment when you knew you were loved. Yeah. And I thought of you, dad, and I thought how you used to read uh, Buford the Bear to me. Yeah. Oh, he'll love it. That's, <laughs> that's so, I mean, you it's see, beautiful for me to have that moment, but also what a gift to give. And as a father of three daughters, let me just tell you, it, 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 it it, 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 means, it means a tremendous amount. So when I talk about these practices, I mean them like that. I don't mean them as some kind of discipline. I don't mean them as some kind of challenge. I really, I tire of this language of challenges and, you know, yoga challenges and, you know, uh, blah, blah, blah. Everything doesn't have to be a challenge. You know, when your dad read to you, he wasn't doing like the, you know, do for the bear reading challenge. He was just, he was just being with his daughter, you know? Yeah. So I would really, I mean, if you want that kind of challengey stuff, you know, there's, it's a dime a dozen. It's everywhere. For me, what you get is um, act with love. Right. And so like that, that right there, that's just a, uh, an example that small things matter. Um, and the evidence of it is in your remembering itself. Like, look at the thing you remembered, a dad reading a little book to a girl. I mean, what a small thing that is. I've asked these kinds of questions all over the world to thousands and thousands of people. And they never think of, you know, a ski trip to Switzerland uh, or a, a new Maserati. They think about these little quiet moments. Um, those moments, if you really think about the people in your life who you love, those landscapes of love are filled with these just small, you know, like my grandma used to let me stir. She used to let me help make pancakes. And she <laughs> I would stand up on the chair and, at, you know, where I was high enough to get to the counter and she would let me stir. I thought it was the most marvelous thing. Oh, that's so beautiful, Kelly. You know, well, see, this is it. All right. So when we start talking about all of these kinds of things, about moving your body, about eating real food, about attending to your social connections, um, I... I, it, would, it would mean a lot to me if people came away from this thinking of these not as disciplines or challenges or things to add to their to-do list, but instead um, as acts of love. Um, I was in, uh, uh, years ago, I was in Australia and I was um, interviewed by uh, Sue Jackson for the Australian Yoga Journal about my yoga practice. And uh, she asked me how often uh, I practice and I said, well, you know, probably six days a week, every day, mostly, just about every day. And she said, oh, you're so disciplined. So, so she asked me uh, how often I practice. And I said, well, you know, six days a week. And she says, oh, you're, you're so disciplined. And, and it was funny because at the time I had never thought about it in terms of discipline. Uh, and I said to her, I said, um, do you have children? And I knew she did. And she said, yeah, sons, you know. And I said, when they were small, um, did you feed them? And she was like, sort of, of course, you know. And, and I said, every day. <laughs> and she sort of smiled. And I said, you're so disciplined. Oh, you know? that's but, beautiful. Yeah. You know, you know I, I, I move my body um, uh, as a kindness. You know, because if I think about the people who I loved, um, you know, I, I would want to help them, you know, I'd want to support them. I'd want to bring them along for a walk, uh, with me. So one is to approach these things, uh, as a kindness. Another 
I think guiding sort of uh, 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 light in this um, is that small things matter. And, uh, and I would say across the board, small things matter. So I just asked you about someone you love and the thing that you thought of was just a small thing. And I promise you, if people pause and think about that for just a moment, what they'll think about is um, small, small acts. Small things, um, patterns of small things, um, um, are, uh, produce uh, health. And so, you know, when it comes to social interactions, um, you know, you pausing just for a moment uh, to remember, you know, your love for your own father is, a, is like social nutrition for you you offering that you paused in that way to him is like social nutrition for him. Like your dad, you could think of it this way. He might be a little hungry socially right now yeah. and you could help him with that, you know, and in helping him do that, you know, he might, he becomes, because we're social mammals, he becomes a little more likely to do that with the people around him. Like, like, um, like maybe he tells your mom about that. Or maybe he tells one of your siblings, you know, about that. Um, and, you know, that love can kind of propagate in that way. Same thing goes with um, um, nutrition. Small little things, um, small little changes in uh, nutrition, patterns uh, of uh, change in nutrition uh, can produce, you know, really... Uh, quite remarkable benefits. And the other thing is that when you do one small thing, it makes it a little more likely that you'll do another small thing. Uh, so like um, with movement practices, for example, um, people say, oh, I hate, I hate running, you know, and uh, uh, they'll, they'll tell me, oh, I go run and, you know, I'm running for like three minutes and I feel like I'm going to die. And I say, oh, my goodness, why are you running for such a long period of time? That's crazy. You know, I'll tell them, here, here's what I would like you to do is, you know, if you have some place that you have to walk to anyway to get the mail or something like that, um, I would like you to run for three seconds or five seconds at the maximum for five seconds. So just run for five seconds. You don't even have to run fast, but just run for five seconds and then just go back to a walk, you know, and, and, and just do that, you know, once a day, just a five second, you know, run. And just do that like every day for the next week. And because here's what will happen is if you do a little five second run every day as you go get the mail for the next week, you, you're going to get out there and you're going to feel like, well, maybe 10 seconds would be better, you know, because that first five seconds of running opens the door to 10 seconds of running. Um, uh, running in particular is one of those where, if people get into it too fast, they hurt themselves and then they're back on the couch. Um, I know the data on this, I mean, intimately. And there are many large data sets um, that show that if you look at uh, something like leisure time running and you break the population of runners out from people who don't run at all to people who run um, a small distance, you know, all the way to a large distance, really slow all the way to really fast, um, just about any metric, frequency, people who run only once you know, a week and people who run every day. If you look at the health benefits of that, almost all of the benefits happen as soon as you get off the couch. So okay. even the people who run, you know, not very much, not very far and not very often, uh, get about 80% of the benefits that you see uh, in, you know, dedicate uh, among dedicated runners. I mean, that's, uh, that's incredible. It, it, it really is. I mean, the data are, are stunning on it. And s sometimes people would be like, yeah, but, you know, I smoke or, you know, uh, I eat uh, horribly or something like that. So, you know, that, the, the numbers are only good for those runners because they're all doing all these other healthy things. Well, actually, and, and 
not to push running too hard because there are lots of ways to move your body. Um, but we have a lot of data on running and it tells us something about movement in general. Um, one of the things that we know because we have such big data sets is that the amount of risk reduction, um, so running uh, produces about a 45% reduction in cardio, cardiac risk. So about a 45% reduction, almost half of your uh, cardiac risk can be removed uh, by running. And like I said, about 80% of that benefit happens as soon as you get off the couch. Um, there's something else called all-cause mortality, and that basically means anything that can kill you, including cardiac things, but just cancer, accidents, everything. All-cause mortality um, uh, is reduced by 30% uh, among runners as compared to non-runners. And these are in data sets that run over, you know, 15 or 20 years. Wow, that's huge. And if you look at the subsets within there of people with chronic illness or people who are um, heavy drinkers or heavy smokers, the risk reductions are actually even larger. So, not that it takes you down to the risk of a non-smoker, but the amount of benefit that you get from running is even larger for smokers than it is for non-smokers. So that's even, yeah, I guess more, more perspective on why, even if it feels uncomfortable or it's not part of your lifestyle at this point, maybe doing that five seconds is really meaningful in, in terms of valuing yourself, your health, and, and being there for the people you love. It, it, you know, it's, it, I, I love my like little five second running practice uh, is, is a wonderful one because it takes off the table all of the toxic elements uh, of competition and taking yourself too seriously and, and uh, you, know, or, you know, some big accomplishment or something like that. Because if you tell people about it, they'll like laugh, you know. They're like, oh, you know, oh, how far did you run yesterday? I said, well, I was about, about 20 feet, I think. <laughs> and laugh. And so if you take this practice on, just like I was in that first yoga class, and I spent almost the whole class in child's pose. See, it's not just the thing, it's the meaning of the thing. And, and that yoga class, it wasn't just, the actual physical practice, it was that I was there taking care of Kelly. You know, and when I take myself out to run uh, these days, it's, it's, it, it's, it's, it's the meaning of that act as much as it is the act itself. And so if you start doing that like little, you know, that little run, like if you, if you loved someone and they were immobilized, and you could maybe get them to run with you for just five seconds. Yeah. You know, just five seconds, and that five seconds might give them a chance at 10 on another day, you know, down the road. Wouldn't that be something? That's really See? beautiful. Yeah. So to take these things in small portions, um, and the good news, you know, and another kind of guiding principle, I would say, um, you know, in kindness, um, small things matter, everything interacts. So another really good thing about this is, you know, some of these things, maybe you're in a position where you can't do anything about them. Like sometimes we're, you know, you, you have a bad leg or something like that, and there's just stuff that you can't do. Um, so it's really important that you kind of get the art of the doable here you know, to sort of find what it is that you can do and do it in, you know, and do just little small bits of it as a pattern and trust that your body, that your life, not just your body, but your whole life is this integrated thing. It's not all these separate things. And so, you know, that meal that is offered to yourself in kindness, you know, that, that little five second sprint that you offer to yourself in kindness, that little social connection that you make in kindness. All of those 
those systems are the same systems. The, the same, those inflammatory processes that I was talking about earlier um, are also impacted by sleep. So you, if you have disrupted sleep, it lights up those inflammatory processes. If you put yourself to bed a little bit early and give yourself a little extra sleep, that has a protective uh, uh, effect. Um, in fact, um, like sleep and diet are um, a, a deeply interconnected. Um, if you m have poor sleep, it upregulates appetite hormones. Right? And from yes. an evolutionary perspective, of course, this makes perfect sense because when would your sleep get interrupted on the savanna? You know, maybe if you're in danger act or there was wild animals in there. Well, if you're under threat, um, you need to take on extra uh, energy and extra calories in order to fight that threat off. And so, of course, when your sleep is impaired in that way, it, up, it, it, it causes your body to say, okay, you're in trouble. You need more calories. In the same way, if you give yourself plenty of rest, right? Same, same way, like if you're exposing yourself to social hostility, for example, um, your body says you're in danger. Take on more calories, you know, more energy is needed, right? So these things all interact with one another. You know, another important piece with that social, and you know, I talked to you about social goodies, but another thing is to monitor your exposure to social toxins. Um, so one of the things, uh, like I'm, uh, like I, I, as much as I detest Mark Zuckerberg and I really, really wish that they would take Facebook away from him because he doesn't, he, he shouldn't, he shouldn't own Facebook. It should be like a public utility, I think. Um, but, um, and a lot of people really hate on Facebook, but really, uh, there are a lot of different things going on on Facebook and, you know, I am in contact with many of the people I love all over the world, you know, uh, on a daily basis through that social network. Um, but, uh, uh, and I have like an open Facebook profile. So I've got, you know, thousands of people that I connect with on Facebook. You really have to use that block button or, if it's somebody you don't want to just like disappear them from your Facebook universe, you can just hit that pause button. You know, there's that little button, you just hit it and they just drop out of your feed for a month. Like I do this on the principle that no one ever won a Facebook fight. Yeah. Like that's never happened. If you fight, you lose. You know, the things that, you know, I mean, think of a time where you ever like, was, gosh, I was just wrong about that. I mean, it just, it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't happen, like does it? So I, I don't host fights. You know, if I post anything uh, political, I tell people, you know, if you want to fight about this, fight elsewhere. If you fight, if you put any comment in here um, that is trying to pick a fight with me or pick a fight with anybody who responds to this, I'm going to delete you from my Facebook universe. You know, like yeah. without comment, you're just going to go away. Um, this even includes like exposure to social hostility, even includes people who I agree with. So um, there are people who I agree with politically, but their rhetoric is so filled with hostility. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to be careful. I'm um, extremely sensitive socially uh, to social toxins. And there's variability in people. And, and some of us are just have baked in sensitivity to social um, hardship. And, uh, you know, like when I was a, a boy, I, I would cry. Anyone could make me cry. The mm -hmm. teacher could make me cry. Just a, a hard look would make me cry. Um, I hated that about myself when I was a kid. Um, now it's my career. Yeah, <laughs> being able to that, connect and feel those yeah, feels. That, that, that sense, of, but yeah, that sensitivity that made me such an easy target for bullies. Um, 
is the same sensitivity that has um, uh, made me a good therapist and made me a good teacher. Um, and it's not my enemy. But it is true that I need to take extra care of myself. You know, some people are maybe more robust and people say hard things to them or around them and it just doesn't bother them that much. I'm not that guy. I'm easily hurt. And so if people are pouring um, hard social interactions into my world, then I just hit the pause button for like 30 days. And, you know, it's actually kind of surprising that it's a pretty small number of people in the thousands of people who interact with my Facebook page that actually cause that. Like, it doesn't take very many. Yeah. So this is a, another example. Small things matter. Matter, yeah. You know, 30 days later, I'll notice it'll come back up and I'm like, oh. <laughs> and then I start thinking maybe this person just maybe needs Maybe it's the oh. delete button. <laughs> well, or, or there's actually mm -hmm. some people who I just know they will be paused until after the November presidential election. Like, I just won't see them unless I go to their page for the next, you know, six months or so because... It, you know, it, it, it will just uh, aggravate me. And I'm not like living in a bubble or anything. I read the news. I know what's going on. But it's uh, your but act I, of care, isn't it? Your act of like self-compassion and love for yourself. Like all of these, as you said, they're designed to be acts of love rather than rules and sort of, I guess, yeah. have tos. It's, it's a kindness. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's a, you know, looking good and being right. I swear to God, if you look in, out in your own life at the places where you have trouble in life and you take issues of looking good and being right off the table in those conflicts, like try to find a conflict that you have out there that mm -hmm. doesn't have issues of looking good and being right. <laughs> you know, or not looking bad and not being wrong, you know, are just like sort of central to it. I mean, a human being will drive off of a cliff in order to, you know, you know, not be wrong, you know, you know, it's a disease. Uh, so to counter what? some of those diseases, and I, I think you're right, I think there is this mentality that, that we do get really stuck in our beliefs and, you know, kind of acknowledging when there might be toxins in our environment, whether it is aggressive, you know, social commentary or, you know, disagreements, whatever it might be, that we can take a step back from that virtually. You gave sort of the block and the pause options on Facebook, which is something that we'd all be surrounded by. And right now might be actually a really protective thing, having that social connection if we're using that medium in the right way. But probably this extends to in our day-to-day -day life, if we can take a step back yes. from relationships that don't fill us up, that might be sensible yes. too. Yeah, and some of them you can't eliminate them, but even if, you, like, say you have a coworker that you, you know, don't get along with very well, and you know, sometimes these are coworkers you don't get along with very well that you maybe are never going to get along with them very well, and you can't really do anything about that. But if you look at those interactions, you can look and see if there are certain things that make it worse. Mm -hmm. And just let go of those things. You know, maybe you just don't, you, you just let certain conversations go. Um, uh, so there are small things that we can do in there, you know, uh, uh, patterns, you know, and what you want to look for is look for patterns of these kind of uh uh, social toxins, negative social hostility, I would say is the big one. Mm -hmm. Social isolation uh, uh, is a big one, and a negative social comparison is another one. Where you know it's sort of like, oh gosh, he's got that, or you know, like that. I, 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 uh, I used to use a, an app called Runkeeper, and okay. so I'm out on one of my astonishingly slow runs. You know. And uh, it tell it'll it'll after the run, 
it tells me, it rates my run in terms of all of my runs. And so I'll post a run and it'll say, this was your 257th fastest three to five mile run. I'm like, yeah, winning. <laughs> No, and I, I do it on purpose, you know. It's just sort of like, no one cares how fast an old man runs. I'm an old man. You know, I'm not going to be in the Olympics, you know. No one cares if I run a mile, you know, one minute faster today than I ran it before. I don't care, you know. No, but that might no be a cares. practice, wouldn't I think for myself, for the listeners, everyone hearing this goes, oh, okay, it's okay not to care. Like we can still do something meaningfully out of love and the result is not the end product. It's about the action, the journey, and that being an act of kindness. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I actually, and it's so baked into the environment to compete, including like competing uh, uh, with yourself, you know, so the apps, my app is trying to get me to compete with myself. You know, it, it wants me to set goals to compete with myself. You know, I mean, I, I, I why would I want to do that? You know, I just, I can, you know, I, it's, it's a place where when I was a child, it's very instructive because, you know, when I was 10 years old, say, every minute that they didn't have me trapped in a schoolroom, I was out in the woods climbing trees and running and chasing my brothers. I was incredibly fit as a child, you know, and I didn't have any training regimen at all. I didn't have a coach. I didn't have anybody forcing me to run laps. I didn't have to keep any records. You know, no one had to, I mean, if, if you think about it, like in this area of movement, children in friend invented uh, interval training. I mean, seriously. I mean, think about how a child plays. A child will never go and run at a steady pace for 45 minutes. It never, ever happened. They run, in, they sprint, and then they walk, and then they roll around on the ground, and then they hang from the monkey bar, and then they run a little bit more, and then they walk a ways. They, they invented CrossFit. I mean, that, that, I, I swear. <laughs> The person who invented CrossFit, they were probably like at a playground and they like watch the kids and they're like, oh yeah. So they're, they're hanging by their arms and then over here they're climbing and then they're crawling underneath. And they're like, okay, and I'll call it CrossFit. I mean, seriously. <laughs> That's a beautiful analogy because again, it goes back to sort of that mindfulness, that, that movement practice that can be really connected in with where you're at in any given day. And if you're showing up and you know, you're not feeling the same way you were on that first run and now you're on your 258th or whatever it may be, you're actually more in touch with where you're at that day by just responding to yourself, to the surroundings and having that as a holistic practice, like a child would, you know, they're just showing up each day. They're no, not forward. They're not back. Well, and, and, and how does the child, um, like before they get into the environment where they've got them competing with one another. So summertime is a good, it's good to think about summer, you know, because then how did the child know how far to run? When you were a girl, how did you know how far to run? Until I just couldn't, I couldn't run exactly. anymore. <laughs> exactly. Your body or something you, distracted. Yeah. Your body. Exactly. That's right. Your body and your attention. Um, told you how far, how fast, what to do next. Everybody's got a body. Everybody's got attention. We just forget. We forget, you know, and then we think we need, you know, some kind of plan or program uh, uh, to teach us. I mean, if you got it like a little kid in your life, like you, did you say you have a daughter? I do. Yeah. How old? 17 months. 17 months. Oh, well, you're in for it. Still. <laughs> still. No, that's, it's wonderful. I, I have uh, three daughters and they are magnificent. Uh, you can even, at, even at that age, uh, like, uh, let me tell you, like something a kid uh, loves, a, a child loves, um, is child-directed play. So like play where they're in charge of the play. And even at 17 months where they can't even get the concept of child-directed play, you can give them child-directed play. So this is what you do is you get down on the ground and then whatever she does, you do that. So if she yeah. like lays down, you lay down. 
you. Pretty soon, she'll, she'll, she'll catch on to the game and she'll start directing you. She'll start doing things because when she does them, you do them. And, you know, what an awesome superpower that is. That's be- and what a mindfulness practice for me to be present. And probably listeners who are listening as well can tune into the concept that we can be present with something and we don't always have to be in charge, so to speak. We can be following, you know, a toddler, we can be following our children. And when we're out moving, we're following almost our inner child ourselves too. You're, you're, you, you know, um, uh, teach your parents well, you know, your, your child can do, and I think about this too. If you put yourself in the, the rigorous demands of like behaving like a 17 month old, you know, like, I mean, do you get like, it's, it's, it's gentle, you know, there's yeah. a kindness to it. You know, you're not going to get a, an overuse injury. You're, you're not going to get a repetitive motion injury, right? It's not going to happen. You got, you got to get on the treadmill to get a repetitive motion injury. You're not going to get that playing with a, a kid. They know when to stop. This is a, they're still talking to their body. You can learn your own body. You know, one thing it made me think of, because a lot of this has to do with allowing ourselves to come to rest. Mm. You know, we forget how to come to rest. Um, and, and then we try to do things like mindfulness, but it's so hard. Um, uh, so uh, can I offer you like a little mindfulness practice? I think that sounds beautiful. This is a really yeah. nice gift. Yeah. So, so this one uh, 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 is is a pr- particular one, and I um, um, am taking this. I just heard about this exercise from one of my former graduate students. She offered it to parents in her parenting group, and I heard it. And as soon as I heard it, I thought, "Oh my God, that is brilliant!" Right. So let me give credit where credit is due. Emmy A. Bear. Uh, is her name. And so um, uh, if people out there have um, uh, a child in their life, um, uh, here's um, Emmy's uh, uh, mindfulness practice. She said, wait till your child goes to sleep and then let your sleeping child uh, be the center of your mindfulness practice. So when when they drop off to sleep, then just take some moments and begin to notice the way the hair lies around their face, you know, that, you know, like what shape their face takes on and that kind of deep relaxation, Uh, maybe the shape of their eyes and the shape of their nose. And maybe you'll listen to the kind of small inflow and outflow of breath. Just take that little five minutes to just watch them sleep listen to them sleep maybe you could lean in near and when they're older they won't let you do that oh now, isn't that i'm getting a teary even thinking of it kelly it's amazing what a beautiful practice that's a gorgeous a gorgeous practice that you know those of us in the in the situation where we where we have such a beautiful object of mindfulness and love and connection that we should definitely be taking that in and savoring it shouldn't we um should i notice that is the word yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we could we could <laughs> you 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 could do that i mean here's the way to think about it think about it as a gift like yeah. would that be a gift to yourself to give yourself 5 minutes just taking in the smallest details of watching your little girl sleep. Mm. I, I loved it as soon as Emmy said it. I just She, she actually did this group, uh, a parent's group. And at the end of the group, she said, you know, what was the best thing in the group? And multiple of the parents in this parenting group said that that was the best thing in the, in the, in the whole group that they did. And I, I immediately recognized it because I have so many pictures of my children sleeping. You just, like, I've got videotape of my children sleeping. <laughs> nothing else. They're just sleeping, you know. Not like gymnastics. They're just sleeping. Because, you You're know. Taking that gift. They're, they're so uh, beautiful when they sleep, aren't they? No matter mm-hmm. how fussy a child is. No matter how difficult. You could have a child like me when I was a child. But when I was asleep, my mother told me I was like an angel when I was asleep. <laughs> 
Oh, Kelly, this is such a beautiful note to wrap things up on because again, it talks through this idea that these are like gifts that we can be giving ourselves. And even, you know, I noticed it immediately slipped out in my language, the shoulds that we are, I guess, mm. culturized into that we should be doing all these things and that there's these cultural expectations for what we mm. must do or what is, you know, optimal behavior. But in actuality, if we take this lens of giving ourselves these gifts and thinking how we would treat someone we love and holding ourselves as someone we love, thinking back to when we were little kids running around in the forest or mm. whatever it may mean for our history, if we could give ourselves these gifts of of health you know in in, in a way that's that's kind and and fun you know to make a five second run eating an apple well, before we consume something else you know um uh, just to add one more little gift to parents i'm you know my children are all grown now um uh, but i have heart for all the parents right now uh, yeah. particularly right now because i know how hard and scary it is and how like the kids are scared a lot of times and um that because we're social mammals social mammals um do well like it's baked into our genome to do like the ones around us do and your children like here's an extra benefit of self-care and it wasn't one that i thought of when i started taking care of myself uh, but it is been one that has been incredibly meaningful to me um, is that um when I first started um, when I first started my yoga practice I had um, my youngest daughter was a competitive swimmer so she swam long distances and for the first three years that I was going to yoga she was um, continuing in competitive swimming um, and about three years into my yoga practice uh, she graduated from high school and started college in the same town, but there was no more swim team. And she had been watching me go to yoga for three years. And so she says to me, maybe I'll start going to yoga with you, dad. I know, right? I'm, I'm just like dying. Like, and then her sister, you know, was like, maybe I'll go to yoga too. And so there was like a period of time there in Mississippi when, I was like regularly in yoga with like both of my daughters. My wife was going, we had like a whole Wilson row. <laughs> now, so if you think about that, like I said, everything interacts. Your children are learning from you all the time. Not so much what you tell them, but they're watching what you do. And so, you know, if you imagine, you know, like the day comes, um, when your daughter loses you and they speak uh, on that day um what if she were to say you know the thing about my mom is she she always took care of herself and she was playful just what you just said you know what i learned from my mom i learned uh, to take uh, to take time for this yeah yeah Oh, that's so incredibly powerful. That really, I, it speaks to the heart. <laughs> so when I took myself to yoga, was I engaging? Was I uh, um, doing self-care or was I being a father? Um, or was I being a teacher? Or was I, I was being all of those things. Everything interacts. It all connects. This is a beautiful note. Everything interacts. What what we do matters. And maybe listeners starting with, with sending that text message to the person they thought that they loved, spreading the love, spreading those acts of kindness, and that it will all connect and come back to us in its own way, giving that gift. <laughs> it just delights me, the idea that some people will be getting uh, some text messages like that. Oh, Kelly, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and your time with us today. There is undoubtedly hours more of conversation we could have in these areas, but you have been so, so generous. Thank you so much for acting with love and connection with all of us. 
and inspiring and contextualizing some of the, the care that we can turn to ourselves and to think of how we would treat someone we love and, you know, connecting them with that, that playful element that, <laughs> that we maybe have lost over the years. So checking back in with our little selves and, and finding a way to nurture, to love, to act with kindness and to, in that, spread, spread kindness. <laughs> Well, I hope that you found this interview with Dr. Kelly Wilson as heartwarming and as motivating as I did. I found it so empowering. I also really walked away to practice some of these amazing exercises, you know, watching my daughter sleep for one thing, but also going out and doing shorter runs, just getting myself off the couch, out the door. And I've even tried, if you remember from last episode, some barefoot running. So it's definitely given me some food for thought, so to speak. And I hope perhaps that it's planted those seeds in yourself. As Dr. Wilson has so kindly offered, you can read one of his wonderful book chapters that actually looks at this framework of first medicine in the context of evolutionary psychology. So please head to the show notes, drcaitlin.com to be able to download and access that resource. And of course, there'll be links there to Dr. Wilson's amazing work, including his own website, onelifellc.com, as well as some links to his books. I highly recommend The Wisdom to Know the Difference, which is a book focusing on supporting individuals to move through addiction, which is something that Dr. Wilson has struggled with himself. You know, he's very knowledgeable in this area. As well as Things Might Go Terribly Horribly Wrong, which is a fantastic resource in regards to anxiety. And if you're a therapist, definitely grab Mindfulness for Two, an ACT approach to mindfulness in psychotherapy. So again, all of those links can be found on the show notes, as well as some links to connect with Dr. Wilson on Facebook and Twitter. And please, if you do have a moment, leave a review for the Wisdom for Wellbeing podcast on iTunes or wherever you're listening to this. I've actually put together a how-to on um, the webpage for the show notes as well. So if you're confused about how to leave an iTunes review because you haven't done it before, just have a quick watch there. It only takes a minute and it would mean the world to me and the Wisdom for Wellbeing podcast because that's really how we get this information out and start to make this shift in our community. All right. Thank you so much for your time and I'm looking forward to seeing you next week. Bye for now. Thanks for joining us this week on the Wisdom for Wellbeing podcast. Please visit drcaitlin.com to connect, find show notes, other episodes, and to subscribe. While you're at it, if you find value in the show, we'd appreciate a rating or perhaps simply tell a friend about the show. Wisdom for Wellbeing is not a substitute for professional, individualized mental health treatment. If you are in crisis, please contact 000, your local emergency number if you are outside of Australia, or attend your local hospital ED.